Hello and welcome. My name is Alan Huang and I work here at the MathWorks in Technical Marketing. I work with image and video processing products, including Mapping Toolbox. So today I'm going to be discussing mapping and geospatial data analysis using MATLAB. Now there's quite a few things I'd like to cover, so let's go ahead and get started with the agenda. Now the first thing we'll take a look at is an overview of Mapping Toolbox. I like to go over the key features and functionality that's built into the product, just to give you an idea of the types of problems it can help us solve. But the majority of our time today will actually be spent inside MATLAB in the following three demos. An oil spill simulation, a weather avoidance demo, and a train analysis demo. Now each of these will highlight different parts of the toolbox, but will give us an idea of how we can use MATLAB and Mapping Toolbox to solve a geospatial problem. After that, we'll come back into PowerPoint and take a look at some related toolboxes. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them at the end in a question and answer session. And so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now, the first thing I want to take a look at is an idea of how someone works with geospatial data. And here we have the technical computing workflow, which divides the process into three main stages. At the beginning, on the left-hand side, we need to access our geospatial data in some way. And they could be stored in a file, in a database, or perhaps on the internet. But we need to grab it in some way and bring it over to the second stage where we can process it. And so in this stage, you, you might do some data analysis or modeling or algorithm development, but basically process our data in some way to produce some output or extract some information. And we pass those results over to the last stage where we share it in some way, either by creating a report, maybe uh, creating a map visualization, deploying an application, or even just writing our process data out to a new file format so that you can share it with other GIS software. Now, ideally, we like to improve our productivity by automating this entire process. And this is how MATLAB and Mapping Toolbox can help us out when working with geospatial data. And we'll see this in action as we get to those demos later on. Now, the next thing I want to look at is where we see this workflow happening. And so on this slide, I've listed out a number of applications and industries that make use of geospatial data. So whether you're working with aerial imagery in aerospace and defense, sea temperature data or natural resource information or even weather data in the financial industry, uh, we see that there's this access, processing and sharing uh, is a really common way to work with uh, geospatial data. So although these industries really don't have much in to do with each other, the types of tasks and problems that they're solving uh, are really quite common. And so this is really where Mapping Toolbox can come and help us out. And so here I've listed out uh, the key features of the product and how they relate to those three stages of the technical computing workflow, from importing and exporting geographic data in that access stage, to creating 2D and 3D maps like on the right-hand side, and uh, geospatial analysis and analyzing terrain data. We'll go into each of these in more depth over the next few slides, but I just wanted to give you a high-level view of what kind of capabilities the mapping toolbox can provide to us. So let's go ahead and dive into that first bullet, importing and exporting geographic data. Now there really are a lot of file formats that the product supports, and if you want to get a comprehensive list, you could I'd recommend going to our website at www.mathworks.com. You can navigate over to the product page for Mapping Toolbox, and there you'll find full documentation for all the functions inside the product, and that includes a list of all the file formats that we support. Now I've listed here some notable ones um, that we support, such as Esri shape files, KML files, GeoTIFF, and digital elevation models. Well. Take a look at the actual functionality and practice in, in the demos later on how we actually read data into MATLAB. But I want to focus a little bit more on that last bullet, uh, importing data from web map service or WMS servers. Now this is new functionality to Mapping Toolbox that came out in 2000, uh, R2009B. And for those who aren't too familiar with WMS, it's a protocol that was developed by the Open Geospatial Consortium for serving rendered data, uh, rendered maps over the internet. So there's a lot of organizations out there, uh, such as NASA, USGS, and NOAA, that provide these WMS servers and provide data layers to the public. So on the right-hand side, we've got an example data layer of the Larsen Ice Shelf, uh, and it's collapsed over, I believe, a few month uh, period. And so this is an animated data layer, and I've really seen a lot of um, a wide range of data layers available through WMS, from uh, air pollution to sea temperature, as I mentioned before, uh, here we've got the Larsen Ice Shelf, we've got natu natural resources. Uh, there's really a huge range of uh, data available on the internet. And to help you find the data set that's applicable to your, um, to your problem, the Mapping Toolbox provides a pre-qualified database of WMS servers as well as search functionality to help you narrow down quickly what you're looking for. And so I think this is a great opportunity. Just let's go ahead and jump into MATLAB and show you how you can use this database and the search capabilities to find data through WMS. So what I'm going to do here is use the WMS find function, which is uh, the function to search through this 
qualified pre-qualified database. And so what you can do is use a number of keywords, server URLs, geographic locations, and whatnot um, to basically find some uh, data layers that you can use. So for a moment, if we pretend we're in Canada and we want to look for um, uh, maybe NRCAN, which stands for Natural Resources Canada, we can specify our search field to be server URLs. So any server URL that has NRCAN uh, inside the name, let's return those servers. And I return them here into this variable A, in which we can look at the size and see there's nearly 4,000 data layers out there for us to work with. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look at the top three. And we see that there's, uh, for the first top three, there's uh, a variety of data layers on mineral deposits. The first one has to do with gold uh, deposits. So let's go ahead and take a look at that one. Now, all the data here is already stored in this database that comes with Mapping Toolbox. If we want to update it, you can use the WMS update function. And let's go ahead and store this into a new variable B. And what this will do is communicate with that server and download the most up-to-date information. And so you can see here we've uh, downloaded an abstract that basically tells us a little bit more about this uh, data layer. So it's something with uh, bedrock hosted gold deposits. Let's go ahead and just download this data and see what, what it looks like. So here you can use the WMS read function, pass in the server name, and uh, MATLAB's gone ahead and downloaded our data into the workspace. And so what I can do is just do a quick IAM show on this variable C and display this image. Uh, remember, these are rendered maps coming down from uh, these servers. And so we have a bunch of these uh, kind of goldish squares <laughs> showing where these uh, gold deposits are. Now let's go ahead and put this onto a map. Um, you might have noticed that the second um, variable over here, R, it's actually the referencing matrix, and it tells us how this image is oriented on a map. So what I can do is let me first load in a coastline, and we'll create a Mercator map axis. And I'll just go ahead and plot uh, those coastline down onto our map. So now we have a little bit of reference of where these gold deposits are going to be. So what I can do is type hold on and use the GeoShow function to display our gold uh, deposits using this referencing matrix. And if I zoom in, we can see it's already aligned our uh, gold deposits for us to show where, they, where they're located. And so that's a quick way to um, find data using these WMS find functions. There's also a number of uh, search routines to help you narrow down your search. Uh, but basically, it's very quick to download data into MATLAB and display it in a map. So let's go ahead and, now that we've seen a quick example of accessing web map service servers, let's take a look at the next um, key feature inside Mapping Toolbox, which is creating 2D and 3D maps. And so we already saw this a little bit in that quick demo, but there's a lot of map displays that Mapping Toolbox supports. So you can display point uh, data, line data, polygons, imagery. Um, on the right-hand side here, we have uh, the Blue Marvel image, which was downloaded again via WMS. Uh, in this case, it's been rendered in many different map projections. And this is one of the key things uh, that Mapping Toolbox provides, uh, the ability to manage map distortions with over 65 map projections. Uh, as part of creating maps, you need to analyze, uh, annotate or customize your maps. So here, uh, I also mentioned a little bit about the markers, colors, skill rulers, and north arrows that you can use. And we'll see this in more depth as we go into uh, our first demo, the oil spill demo, where, we're creating, well, where we will create some maps. Now, the next thing I'd like to take a look at is once you imported your data into MATLAB, we need to go to that second stage where we process it in some way. And so here I've listed out a number of geospatial analysis um, uh, functionality, such as calculating distances, coordinate transformations, navigational calculations. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time to go into depth with each of these, so I find a good way to talk about them is just to look at the, the images on the right where um, different geospatial analysis functionality is being highlighted. In the top image, we're basically calculating a buffer zone. So if you want to calculate maybe um, a threat zone, uh, maybe five kilometers away from a border, uh, you can use one of the functions in Mapping Toolbox to do that. And here we, we're doing that for the Great Lakes border and calculating a, a, uh, probably about 100 miles uh, radius around that. On the lower right, we're plotting some small circles and figuring out which polygons are, are inside of this small circle. And so if you need to calculate distances, like how far do I need to go to uh, achieve a certain objective. Those are the types of things that you can solve inside Mapping Toolbox. 
on the lower left, we're doing some 3D coordinate transforms to orient this radar dome onto uh, the, the surface of the planet to show its effective range. So there's quite a few things that you can do, and we'll get into more depth of these in the actual demos uh, as we move into MATLAB. Now there's also a lot of functionality to analyze terrain data. Uh, and so this is an image that's, that we're going to be seeing a little bit uh, in the terrain analysis demo. But basically, if you need to calculate things like gradient, uh, view sheds, line of sight visibility, and slopes, that type of functionality is available to you in Mapping Toolbox. Now another nice thing that you can do is create a virtual reality world from your elevation data. So if you need to do things like fly-throughs um, and analyze your data in that way, that functionality is available to you as well. And lastly, uh, there's basically a lot of utility uh, functions that that are that underlies all this analysis capabilities inside Mapping Toolbox. So the basic functions to work with vector and raster data, merging lines, uh, segmenting them, combining and changing the spatial resolutions, all those type of utilities are available to you uh, through the toolbox as well. And as we'll see in a little bit, uh, map trimming is one of the, the key functions that we'll look at in the oil spill demo. And so with that, we've basically seen the key features for mapping toolbox, uh, from access to processing to you know creating map visualizations. So I think this is a great opportunity to just jump into MATLAB and take a look at this um, at the functionality in in action. So in this first demo, what we'd like to do is simulate an oil spill. So what we have here is a picture of a bay uh, and some current fields on it. Uh, and so what we want to do is pick a location. Maybe there's a ship that runs aground over here, and there's unfortunately an oil spill. And based on the tidal uh, movements, how is this oil slick going to move around inside the bay? So that's what this cells, um, the script is uh, going to show us. And so I've already made this script and divided it up into a number of cells that I'll run from a high level just to show us what's going on inside the simulation. So in this first cell, we're basically at that access stage of the computing workflow, and we want to import some data into MATLAB. So here I use the shape read function to read in some shape files. And in particular, this one uh, has some Coast Guard stations in it. Now I've also nested a number of shape read functions into this uh, custom script over here called import my data. And so I basically automated the process of importing many uh, shape files. And we have that data over here in the upper left in the workspace. So here we have some bathymetry data, some uh, depth information of the water, our shipping lanes, our shoreline data, Let's go ahead and just take this information and put it onto a map and uh, visualize our data sets. And that's what I do here in this cell. I use the USA map function with a particular latitude and longitude uh, extent. It'll automatically pick a map projection for me. And I use the GeoShow function to basically overlay these data sets on top of each other. So here's our shoreline, railroads, coast guard, and so forth. So I'll go ahead and let this uh, process and create our map visualization for us. And so here we've got uh, basically our vector data sets, our shoreline and, and whatnot, all displayed onto this map. Now, as I mentioned before, Mapping Toolbox gives us the ability to annotate and customize our map. So in this next cell, I'd like to customize it by inserting a scale ruler, north arrow, and some text. And what this will do is label our dredge channel. So this is where the ship, shipping lanes are uh, down here as well. And also scale ruler and north arrow. So we can tell from this that our bay is about five miles in width. Now one other thing I'd like to do is put in a little inset map over here to show where this bay is in relation to the rest of the Texas coastline. And so I do that in this cell using similar functionality that we've already used to create this map. Only I create a secondary map axis, as you can see here, and basically plot the data into this particular location. And I overlay a little red square to show what our primary axis is looking at. So this is a pretty quick way to just uh, take our data and create a map uh, visualization of it. Now the next thing I like to do, since this is all vector data, I just wanted to quickly show how you can combine vector data with raster data. And so this is what our bathymetry data is going to be showing. What I've done with this create map function over here is taken some key functions from these visualization cells up here uh, to create a basic map for me to work with. And so here I've displayed a latitude and longitude and uh, a title as well as just the shoreline data. So what I want to do is now take a look at what the depth looks like in this bay over here. And so that's what the bathymetry data will help me with. If I type bathymetry over here, we basically have 3,000 data points. Um, and if I drill down into the first element, we see it's basically just point data with a particular latitude and longitude and a depth. So what I can do is extract this information 
from this structure into these variables. And let me just create a new figure and plot out these data points. And we see that we've got an irregularly sampled um, uh, set of data points. What we want to do is now interpolate this into a regularly, regularly spaced grid. And that's what we do over here with the geoloc to grid function, geolocations to grid. Uh, it'll go through and interpolate and create a nice regular grid for us uh, to display into a map. In this next cell here, rather than display the entire bathymetry data for the entire bay and ocean, I'm just going to trim it down to this particular latitude and longitude extent. And here's where we see some map trimming functionality. Um, rather than display the entire thing, we just uh, trim it down and overlay it onto the original image. So here I've displayed a color map as well as our data over here. So you can see we can now um, combine both vector and raster data sets together, overlay them properly to, uh, to communicate some more information. So perhaps as our boat was coming in, maybe it ran aground at a certain point over here, and that's why the oil uh, spill occurred. So this could be information that we might need to insert buoys in particular locations. Now let's go ahead and move on to the actual oil spill simulation. So as I mentioned before, uh, what's going to de determine how this oil slick is going to move around is primarily tidal, uh, tidal forces. So what I need to do is create a current field, uh, a current model. Now there's a number of organizations and academic um, uh, organizations out there that perform these kind of models. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to them, so I'm going to create them on my own. And that's the really nice thing about MATLAB, that I can create these models uh, and just test them out with, uh, with our simulations. So here what I'm doing is, again, defining a particular location I want to model my, my currents. And I create a regular grid of data points using the mesh grid function. Now, these regular data points, are some might line up on top of land masses. So when we figure out what our current fields are, we need to make sure that those data points on the land is set to zero. And that's what I do inside this cell. I figure out which points are inside uh, these shoreline polygons, and I just set them to um, a value 1. So I'm creating a binary mask where we have 1s inside land masses and zeros elsewhere. And so here I'm going to display it. And so we have, here's our 1s and our zeros elsewhere. The reason why this is important is because I can invert this image so that uh, the land masses have value 0 and the water values have value ones. So if I overlay that mesh grid, uh, essentially I'll have a number of data points with the current vector for each one, and for anyone that aligns on top of land, I can just zero it out. So now the next step is how do we find, uh, how do we determine our current field? Well, what I did was actually used some functionality in image processing toolbox called ROI Poly. Now what that allows me to do is I can go through and interactively select out a particular location. So perhaps at the mouth of the bay, I might want this kind of uh, field like this. And what it does is for this particular location, I can now create a vector field, such as an outward or inward moving um, circular vector field. And so by iterating that process over all these different channels in this bay, I can then create uh, a current field. And here I'm just going to display uh, particular time steps in our current model. So this is a time bearing current vector field. And as you can see, here's uh, basically as tide's moving out, we now have a vector field pointing out from this, from this mouth. And now tide's going to go back in. And you can see it running down these channels, up and down. So this is a very rudimentary way to basically create a current field. And now we have this time bearing field that we can simulate an oil slick, oil slick moving around inside. So that's what we'll do in this next few cells, simulate how that oil spill moves around. Here I define where that slick is going to originate from. And here I'll just create a figure, again using our create map function, and I display a triangle where our, our oil particles initially are located. And so at this point, we now have basically a current field. And what I can do is use Euler's method to move these particles in particular directions. And so in this cell here, I've basically minimized this for loop but essentially what's happening is, for each particle, I interpolate from my uh, current field which direction it should move in, and move it a tiny step based off of this, this time step. And if I iterate that many, many times, I can basically create um, uh, a simulation, a movie of how these particles are moving around. I just need to capture each figure. And that's what I've gone ahead and done. I'll go ahead and display this model, uh, the simulation, using the play function which will display this AVI file that I've created. So 
So if I play it, we can have our we can see our oil particles and our current field overlaid on top. And we see the tidal forces are initially pushing it outwards. And as part of my script, I actually highlight any polygon that gets touched by, by oil in red. And so here tides move back in. We can see that the oil particles are starting to disperse even more and touch even more of these uh, little islands around the bay. Again, tidal forces are moving it back out. And once these particles reach these islands, um, because the, the current forces are zeroed out inside the masses, they are left here along the edge. Uh, so we can record all this information. Let me go ahead and close this. Uh, basically, I, I was recording where these particles are moving around uh, so that I can compare later on um, and cross-correlate. You know, if these islands have oil on it, what's what else is being affected? And that's what happens here in the following cells. I create a new map and overlay some uh, rookeries onto it. And these are areas where birds will nest, and they're very environmentally sensitive. So I've used these uh, gray polygons to display where these, uh, the, these birds are nesting. And what I can do is cross-correlate where those oil particles ended up and see which of these have been affected. And that's what happens inside this cell using the in polygon function to determine which of these polygons are now affected. And, we're have hi and I've highlighted them here in green. Now, as similar, similarly, we might want to figure out within a particular location, um, the oil slick origin, maybe we want to know everything inside a five uh, nautical mile radius. And so what we can use is this circle function over here to put these types of uh, objects onto our map and help us better manage, uh, maybe clean up for these types of oil spills. So this was a quick introduction uh, to this oil spill demo, uh, but basically we are able to create some map visualizations, create some numerical modeling, and simulate how this oil spill moves around. Now in this next demo, uh, the weather avoidance demo, what we're basically going to do is take a look at a couple new uh, different capabilities inside Mapping Toolbox. First, the ability to access WMS servers. Here we're going to download some backdrop, this blue marble image from JPL, as well as next red weather data that you can see overlaid on top of this image. What we'll do is plan a flight path from, say, San Francisco to Boston. And if that flight path goes through any of these storm systems, let's try and reroute it. So we'll see some navigational function as well as some visualization capabilities inside Mapping Toolbox in this demo. So here we'll go ahead and switch over into the weather avoidance script. Again, this is divided up into a number of cells that I'll run from a high level. In this first cell, I, I create a visualization, uh, basically create a map axis. And the reason why I want to do this, um, I use the USA map function to display uh, a map projection for the continental United States. I want to do this to capture the latitude and longitude extent because I want to use these parameters as input to WMS read function later on. So in this cell over here, I use the WMS find function just like we used before to search for Jet Propulsion Laboratory or JPL servers. I refine my search using this method here to look for only the blue marble image. And then I can use the WMS read function along with these extents that I had recorded before to have the server customize the image for me and display it. So here I'll, I'll go ahead and communicate with the server and have it download it into MATLAB and display it onto that map. Uh, and you can see here I've used the GeoShow function to display this state uh, borders onto our map, just so we have a little reference to what we're looking at. Now in this next step, uh, what I'll do is actually go ahead and uh, dock this image over here. And I'll interactively select using the input M function uh, a start and stop. So let's start from San Francisco and fly to Boston. And I've now recorded those start and stop destinations. And we can now plot some navigation paths onto our, our figure. Uh, in this first cell, I plot the great circle, which is the shortest distance from point A to point B. If we were to extend this completely around the world and back, it would cut the world completely through the center into two equal halves. And so this is the shortest distance that you can fly on a um, uh, on the planet. But this is not the most convenient way to fly because your heading will constantly be changing. Uh, instead, you might use rum lines to uh, fly from a certain point A to a certain point B. With a rum line, you fly along a, a particular heading that's constant. And it will take you, deviate from the great circle, but it's a lot easier to navigate. And you can see that it, it kind of comes down a little bit over here. So if you're ever flying from the west coast of uh, the United States over to Asia, you'll follow these this, this path that goes up and down uh, from the Bering Strait. And this is one of those uh, rum line paths that we're, we're flying along. 
Now you can see over here that I've calculated the distances uh, for the great circle and rum line. You can see that the rum line is a little bit longer, um, so this could become more significant as your flight path increases in length. Now what I'd like to do is download our, our next rad weather data. Again, we use the same functionality of WMS find, our refines, and WMS read. And we play it, display it onto a new map. And you can see that there is a very, very large storm system uh, on top of uh, the Midwest right now. So what I'll do is combine these two data sets, the backdrop and the next red weather data, into a sim, into a one figure. So we've got some really nice visualizations. We can go ahead and select a new start and stop, uh, just in case uh, you know the path from San Francisco to Boston didn't work out. But it looks like it'll be just fine here. So let's fly from San Francisco to Boston. And we see that our flight path will take us right through the center of the storm. So we might want to reroute around it. Now to do this, we need to figure out where the storms are. And we need to do some segmentation. So here I use the image processing toolbox to segment our storm um, from the background. And so we have white where there is uh, considered uh, a big storm. And what we can do is use some morphological operators to basically dilate this and, and maintain just this big storm system as well as these kind of isolated ones out to the side. With that, we can then go ahead and calculate uh, the sizes of all those storm systems. You can see I'm plotting them out over here. We have a very large storm system over here, uh, and I've also plotted the center of them. These are all found using image processing toolbox functionality um, called region props. What region props does is I can take that binary image and calculate things like the convex hull and centroid. So that's what we see here displayed in our, in our figure, the centroid and this convex hull. I've then used mapping toolbox to define a little buffer zone around this, uh, this border, maybe like a no-fly zone. So we see that uh, the flight path takes us through these two separate storm systems. Uh, what I want to do then is uh, figure out all the flight paths that I can take to route myself around it. And here I've created this recursive function that basically goes from a certain point and uh, it goes through each of these storm systems, figuring out how to get us around it. Uh, and I define these midway points um, based off of our initial heading and just turning a 90 degree angle out to the side, figuring out where that intersection is and creating that as our new um, waypoint. So this is not the most uh, sophisticated, complex way to reroute around us, around these storms. As you can see, we're kind of hitting these outer edges. But with these new paths, you can use mapping toolbox functionality to calculate uh, how long each of these paths are, and they reroute us appropriately. So here in gray, we have the original path and this new proposed red line uh, flight path that takes us uh, a little bit around these little storms, uh, tries to reorient us around this major system over here. And so as you can see, um, our new course adds about 100 nautical miles onto our, onto our flight. And so it does a pretty good job at uh, figuring out how to get around this storm system, but in future iterations, and uh, if you want to make this more sophisticated, what one could do is grab WMS layers for the previous maybe 30 minutes and see how these storm systems are progressing and then adjust these flight paths as necessary. You may, we may not need to fly out this far if the storm is already going to move away. So those are the types of things that you can do with Mapping Toolbox in this, in this field. So let me go ahead and clear our data, close our auth figures, and then we'll take a look at our, our last demo, uh, in which case is this train analysis demo. And we already saw this figure um, in a previous slide. But essentially what we'd like to do here is work with some digital elevation model, download some aerial photography from WMS, and then drape it onto this figure. Okay, so we can make these nice, beautiful uh, map visualizations. And after that, we'd like to maybe pick a point somewhere on this mountain range and figure out from there, from that vantage point, what can we see in the valley? All right, so here we are back inside MATLAB. Again, I have a script that's divided into a number of cells that I'll run uh, from a high level. In our first cell here, we're at the access stage of the technical computing workflow, and I read a digital elevation model of San Francisco using the USGS 24K DEM function. Uh, again, I capture the latitude and longitude extent, just like we did for the weather avoidance demo, so that I can use those extents uh, to customize the WMS query. But first, let's go ahead and visualize this data that we've imported uh, using the USA Map and GeoShow function. Uh, I use the DEM CMAP function over here to color, I apply an automatic coloring 
So that higher elevation data is colored in browns and lower elevation is colored in, in greens. So it's a nice way to view our, our uh, elevation data. Now alternatively, alternatively, we could change the viewing angle by modifying the camera position and what we're looking at. So this kind of gives me a side profile of uh, this value over here. So in the next step, what we'll do is use that latitude and longitude data that uh, we captured and communicate that to the WMS server and have them resample the data and pass us a rendered map. So here, we're uh, communicating with the Microsoft Terra server, uh, which has a lot of ortho photos and topographic maps there. Uh, and we're having them resample and basically trim and cut the data so that it aligns perfectly with our data. And so you'll notice here that we're specifying the latitude and longitude extent, as well as the image height and image width. And this is all based on the digital elevation model that uh, we imported. So that when we get this data, we can easily align it and uh, drape the imagery on top. So let's go ahead and let this finish downloading uh, into MATLAB. Okay, so here's our bird's eye view of uh, South San Francisco. And this image has already been ortho rectified so that you know lens uh, distortion and camera tilt are taken into account and you can measure true distances here. So what we can do with this image that we've downloaded is go ahead and drape it onto our digital elevation model by using the same functionality that we did before. We'll create a new figure, use the USA map and GeoShow function to plot our elevation model. But in this case, we'll use the C data parameter uh, and set the ortho image to our color data. So because of the alignment that's already been uh, performed by the WMS servers, it aligns perfectly. And uh, you can see that the mountainous range from the image aligns up correctly with the digital elevation model. Uh, similarly, we can create a new figure and uh, uh, overlay the topographic information on top. And at this point, let's go ahead and uh, manually select out a point and calculate that view shed. So what I'll do is I'll take a look at our first figure, manually select out um, a point. Let's say we select out a point in this little middle valley. So what we would expect to see is uh, areas within here, maybe out on the water a bit, but we shouldn't see anything off to the side. So let's go ahead and select that point. We'll calculate our view shed. Uh, using the viewshed function. Again, we're, we're just passing our latitude and longitude as well as the, the height at that point, as well as the digital elevation model. And here we can go ahead and uh, create a figure and display what we were looking at. So we see here that uh, we're able to see up and down the mountainous range. Let's change our viewing angle. Uh, and we're able to see up the slope, but of course not on the other side, and a little bit out into the ocean over here. Now, alternatively, we could pick out the highest peak in, uh, in the data set. And this is something that MATLAB is really great for. Uh, by looking at this image, which is basically a, a matrix or a, of the digital elevation model, we can easily find the top, uh, top value using the find M function. I can do that. And, and by putting our point over here and displaying again uh, what areas we're able to see, we see that the, the visibility is much higher at this vantage point. So if this was maybe a cell tower that we were placing, ideally we'd like to put it up here um, rather than down inside this valley where there would be limited number of subscribers that could view um, use the cell network. So at this point, let's go ahead and jump back into PowerPoint and uh, wrap this up by looking at the key benefits for mapping toolbox. As we've seen from the technical computing workflow, the toolbox really gives us a lot of features and functionality for each of those spe specific portions and stages of a workflow. Uh, in particular, it gives us the ability to access a variety of file formats um, from, from say, uh, Esri shape files as we saw today, but also WMS servers. We're able to visualize many types of maps both 2D and 3D, and of course, analyze geospatial data. So we, with these three uh, primary components, we uh, look at those three stages inside the technical computing workflow. Now, some similar toolboxes that might come in useful. Uh, the first one I'd like to discuss is the image processing toolbox. And we saw this a little bit in the weather avoidance demo when we were segmenting uh, those weather systems. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into too much depth with this toolbox, but because uh, a lot of geographic data or raster data sets are uh, basically images, the image processing toolbox is extremely useful when you need to analyze parts of your, um, of your data. Maybe segment out certain portions. Uh, in this case, on the right-hand side, we're looking at some multispectral imagery and, and analyzing it.
Another toolbox that might be useful is the parallel computing toolbox. And often, you know, geospatial data is, is really, really huge. There's a lot of uh, information involved. And what you might need to do is distribute a job onto many, many computers, onto a cluster of computers, and divide that job up so that it can get done a lot faster. And that's what's being done here on the right-hand side. This is one of the demos that, unfortunately, we won't have too much time to go into. But it's a land color cover classification demo. And basically, what we want to do is we have data at say maybe um, uh, areas that are forest, forests, uh, grasslands, urban areas at a very high resolution. And what we want to do is if we zoom out, we need to uh, represent this now more coarse grain uh, with a particular color. And so this is a very parallelizable uh, process. And as you can see here, we're, we are uh, calculating for um, particular states, dividing it up uh, onto different computers so that the job can be done a lot faster. Uh, on a local machine, just running through all the data sets takes about 40 seconds, whereas if we uh, divide the job up, we can uh, reduce the amount of time needed. And so this PAR4, if you're interested, this will uh, probably come into play a lot more. PAR4 is basically a parallel for loop. So as we loop through each of these uh, states, you can split that up onto a number of computers. Now, just to give you a little uh, uh, idea of how, what, what people have done with Mapping Toolbox, uh, here's an example of a company that's been using the toolbox uh, to visualize uh, missile tests and the fallout from these missile tests. Now, we, they used other products such as Simulink and the Aerospace Block Set uh, to simulate how uh, these the debris is going to move around in space, but to visualize it, uh, the Mapping Toolbox was used to create these maps. And so we can see uh, these, these folks here were using uh, the toolbox for uh, visualization capabilities. Now, if you're interested in finding out more about the toolbox, there's a variety of places that you can go and take a look. Uh, as I mentioned before, our website, www.mathworks.com, uh, has a variety of uh, information there for you to learn a lot more. Uh, in particular, there's a number of demos, uh, such as the ones I've listed here. Uh, the first one is a uh, WMS demo accessing uh, uh, meteorological data for uh, Katrina and animating it into a movie. Uh, there's also all the documentations available for you there. And uh, if you're interested, if you're already using the tool and you want to uh, see what else is out there, what other code, you can go to the MATLAB Central File Exchange. And this is a place where uh, other users will code up some some algorithms and post it there for other people to use. So if you're looking for a particular functionality, that might be a good place to look uh, to see if you can find it. And of course, uh, please go to our website and check out if there's any upcoming seminars or webinars that you might be interested in, and you can register there um, uh, to attend. And uh, with that, we've basically come to the end of our webinar. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them at this time. Um, you can type them into the lower right, I believe, and I'll go ahead and uh, pause for a moment to collect up uh, the questions, but I'll make sure to go through them all. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope you found this uh, interesting and informative. Um, thank you very much.